Good afternoon, uh, world. Uh, good afternoon, Africa. Um, how are you, colleagues? I really would like to apologize, start by apologizing for starting in not a bit late, a uh, very late. We have had, you know, really big uh, technical challenges. Uh, but as I say, it's better, you know, uh, late uh, than never. I would like to invite you to uh, this webinar on One Health uh, that we are calling Journalism in the COVID-19 Era, Why Health Reporting Must Focus on Human, Animal, and Environmental Issues to Help Combat uh, future uh, pandemics. Uh, my name is Kiondo Bawero. I work with Internews of journalism.network. As most of you would know, Internews is a media development organization that works all over the world, you know, to empower uh, local media with the information they need uh, to communicate better uh, to the public there so that uh, they are better informed uh, to take life changing issues. And as journalism, Network uh, is a program or a, a project of interviews uh, that deals with environment, conservation, wildlife, and climate change. And uh, we have a project here in East Africa uh, that I oversee in Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we're basically training and giving story grants uh, to reporters like yourselves to be able uh, to tell the untold stories on wildlife and conservation and uh, environment, and of course, uh, climate a change. Uh, so a few uh, housekeeping, you know, uh, rules. Uh, kindly, uh, you've joined it uh, muted um, and out of not on video, uh, but you'll be able to see all our panelists who I will introduce uh, in a few. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we actually encourage you to do, uh, please do so on the Q&A icon uh, below the screen, uh, your Zoom screen. You see there is a Q&A and a chat uh, icon. Feature. So kindly put your question uh, on Q&A uh, to any of the speakers. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, uh, your names, and of course the media house uh, that you work for, and direct uh, your question to a specific uh, speaker uh, for today. And uh, and uh, we'll be we'll recording this um, uh, this webinar. I will upload it on our YouTube channel and also on our website, that is ourjournalism.network, where we encourage you uh, to go and see about us. You can join us to be a member. We have about 14,000 uh, members uh, of media across the world uh, who benefit from our resources, you know, like this webinar, some workshops uh, we do, and also story grants uh, that, that we officially give uh, from different uh, regions uh, of the world. Again, thank you so much. And we apologize uh, for, uh, for that a small hitch uh, that we had. And um, a, a brief uh, about uh, why we're doing this webinar is that uh, there is no doubt that COVID-19 has been a disruptor, uh, which has changed the way of life from how we socialize, work, worship, and even travel. But on the other hand, the pandemic in its quest for distraction has offered lessons and new ways of thinking and doing things. Uh, when the news of this epidemic broke, uh, in Wuhan in China in December 2019. Uh, there was a lot of talk that it originated from a wild animal, uh, perhaps a pangolins, which are the most trafficked mammals today. When this has not been proved, uh, the mere thought of this relation of co-infection between animals and people suddenly catapulted a hitherto laid back concept of one health into the limelight. According to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that CDC, three out of every uh, for new or emerging infection, if infectious diseases in people come from animals. CDC adds that uh, One Health is an approach and re that recognizes that the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. It is with this in mind that we have planned uh, for this webinar to help you as a journalist understand the phenomenon or the concepts uh, to help you report better on it to your publics and your audiences. In our quest uh, as change makers, of course, our reporting will be very important in helping to prevent a future zoonotic diseases, which uh, with the effects of climate change uh, might make COVID-19 look like a Christmas party. Uh, to help us in this endeavor, we have um, experts uh, from different fields uh, who will help us unpack uh, first know what one, one Health is, how it's related to uh, the environment, the planet, and as as human beings. And I would like to introduce uh, our speakers uh, right, right now. 
uh, we have four speakers to have joined. Uh, one has sent us a recorded uh, presentation that I will start uh, by, by playing. And in the house, we have Dr. Gladys um, Kalema Zikusoka, uh, who is the founder, uh, sorry, um, who is the founder and chief executive officer of conservation through public health which is a non-profit organization that promotes conservation by improving the quality of life of people and wildlife to enable them to coexist in and around protected areas in Africa. Dr. Kalema uh, will help us understand the relationship between animals, humans, and the planet health, as well as highlight her award-winning work in Uganda and indeed in Africa. Uh, joining us uh, is Elizabeth Merra, who is an award-winning journalist, uh, health and science journalist based here in Kenya. Merab writes about medical science and health research and is passionate about simplifying technical subjects into creative stories that are relatable to both professionals and lay audiences. Merab embraced One Health reporting long before the COVID-19 pandemic, and she will be telling about her experience and how we can effectively engage engagingly uh, tell this story. Our other speaker has sent, as I said, a recorded message uh, which I'll start by playing. Uh, her name is Dr. Wangoi Modigani, a health policy and health systems expert at the Ministry of Health. Uh, she'll give us a peek into what One Health is and why the government and all stakeholders need to prioritize it in primary health care for the attainment of universal health uh, coverage. We also be joined uh, by Professor Noah Sitati, a wildlife species expert at WWF Tanzania, uh, but a Kenyan uh, by birth. Uh, his work involved in anti-poaching initiatives, human wildlife conflict mitigation uh, to ensure wildlife corridors and habitats are secure. Uh, Professor Sitati will tell us how human activity, encroachment, the way we treat animals and the environment put us in the risk of infectious and genetic diseases. Uh, before I play uh, the video uh, from Dr. Mudigani, uh, if you just joined us, uh, please ask your questions uh, on the Q&A section. I've seen a lot of messages on the chat. Please, if you're asking a question, uh, put it on the, on the Q&A uh, section. And uh, we'll put these questions at the tail end. And if the burning questions, uh, we'll ask them as they come. Again, thank you so much for joining us, uh, and we'll try to uh, to be faster so that we can save on the time that we've lost. I'll go ahead first and share my screen uh, to that video from Dr. Wangui Modigani from the Ministry of Health. Uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, Benon or uh, Stefano, are you able to see the video? Uh, not yet. We are not able to see it yet. Uh -huh. How about now? Okay, yes, yes, we are. Okay. Give me a minute. A minute, I start playing. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Wangwe Mutigani. I work with the Ministry of Health in Kenya. I am a medical doctor specialized in health systems and health policy. And I'm glad to join you today to walk you through this session on one health approach. Thank you for joining us and allow me to start on our presentation on the one health approach. So what is this all about? 
The One Health approach has three main components. Those are human health or human medicine, animal health or veter veterinary medicine, and the environmental health or ecology. So these three are interdependent and linked to the health of the ecosystems in which they exist. This is a cross-cutting approach that carries out programs, policies, legislation, and research in which different sectors work together to achieve better public health outcomes. It also seeks to increase communication and collaboration between human, animal, and environmental health professionals. Did you know that two thirds of the known human infectious diseases are shared with animals? Most emerging diseases are associated with wildlife. Can we think of any, any that has us wearing masks, socially distanced, associated with bats? Uh, one guess that we all have that answer everywhere. So the One Health has focused on the integration of the human animal health nexus. And this includes zoonosis and antimicrobial resistance. So why, why One Health? I think we've touched a little bit on it. Zoonotic disease risks from wildlife, livestock, and pets. We have over 75% of emerging infectious diseases being zoonotic. 60% of human pathogens are zoonotic, and most agents of bioterrorism, for example, anthrax, are zoonotic. And beyond zoonosis, disease processes across species are shared. What link does this have with our, sustain, our sustenance? and food security. So agriculture and food security form the foundation of civilization. Food security is inextricably linked with global health, global sustainability, international security, and what didn't I add there, climate change. So many diseases such as Ebola, Zika, Chikungunya, SARS, Nipah, bird flu, swine flu, are emerging and spreading because of widespread deforestation, environmental degradation, and bushmeat consumption linked to food security. Global climate change also affects food security and has impacted the spread of zoonosis within the human population. So this has gone both ways. So it's not animals transmitting to humans in a unidirectional way. We have humans also transmitting to animals. An example of this is human infection, mycobacterium tuberculosis, otherwise known as TB in, in a common language. TB appeared about 40,000 years ago, so this goes way back, and it coincided with the human migration out of Africa, the homeland. So two main lineages, we have 20 to 30,000 years ago, and the second lineage associated with animals. So humans are probably infected, are probably the source of infection in livestock. But in other uh, ways, we know that goats and sheep transmit brucellosis to the human population. We also know about rabbits transmitting to larinia to human uh, populations. And also cattle transmitting the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, also known as mad cow disease, to the human population. So these are things that greatly affect the human population because of that transmission from the animal population to the human population. So where does it start? The history of zoonosis goes back to the BC times. Hippocrates described the link 
between human health and the environment and coined the name malaria. Mal for bad, area for air. So this was bad air, malaria for bad air. It mostly described uh, febrile illnesses or illnesses that are characterized by high fevers. And now we, we in this new world associate malaria with the protozoal disease linked to, to the current uh, diagnosis of malaria. So in the Middle Ages, so now we are in the AD, um, in the 14th century, we had the Black Pest. This, the Black Death, this was transmitted through the bacterium Yersinia pestis, spread by fleas to humans carried by rats. But we made great discoveries in medicine and in public health at the intersection between human and animal health, beginning in the 18th century. Here, we can see the link between, uh, or should we say the aha moment between uh, smallpox and cowpox. And the first case of vaccination came through at that time in, in century. I would also like to draw your attention to the word vaccination comes from uh, the word cow. So cow in Latin is vac, V-A-C-C. -C. And there came the word vaccination due to this discovery that cows infected with cowpox, if we can inject some of that um, substance into humans, it creates antibodies that fight against smallpox. And now in current history, we do not even know what smallpox looks like. We also had uh, the, the advent of germ theory. And this is characterized by Louis Pasteur, who is now the father of immunization. And he studied chicken cholera. We also know Robert Koch, or Robert Koch. He discovered TB. He also discovered anthrax. And he studied anthrax and the link between animal health and the infections in humans. We also know of Rudolf Virchow, a German physician and pathologist who said, between animal and human medicine, there are no dividing lines, nor should there be. He coined the term zoonosis. Then comes the 20th century with boom. We had an explosion of scientific knowledge. Medicine became increasingly specialized and accessible. And that is where we see the divergence of medicine and veterinary uh, medicine, or so does a human medicine and animal health. We also saw emergence of great diseases. We had, and why are these diseases emerging? You can see the picture in this um, slide. We're looking at uh, bad flu and how it infects people. So the, your infection is literally in your backyard. But why are these diseases emerging? We have increasing global population pressures with over 9 billion people in the globe. We have deforestation and environmental destruction at a greater pace than ever before. We also have intensive agriculture. What is this intensive agriculture? We also have climate change. We have destruction of ecosystems all play a role in disease emergence. We also have animals get many of the diseases that humans are getting. Those include cancer, heart diseases, diabetes, obesity. We can see our little dog right here. Um, we also have organ failure, degenerative joint diseases, and um, even as we think about why all these people, the 9 billion people on the planet, we have to eat. We need shelter. We need sanitation. There's greater demand for energy. We need even more need for transportation. This is the price we're paying for our world becoming a village. So we really do need to do more clinical trials in animals especially thinking about the naturally occurring cancers in animals. This is an important area of study and how do these mimic or link 
to human diseases. And coming to think of it, a lot of the products that we use are usually animal tested. Does this have a link with the, with the eruption of an emergence, emergence of disease in both animals and humans? So my question becomes, and our question today is how can one help be promoted? The Ministry of Health for one is well positioned to promote one health, especially under the umbrella of universal health coverage. In this, we establish an integrated approach to healthcare, focusing on preventive and promotive health. And through this, we can establish an interdisciplinary, interspecies collaborative initiatives. We can also develop collegial relations with human and environmental health professionals. We can educate policymakers and the public about the importance of One Health. So what are our take home messages? Human and animal health and environmental health are linked. The One Health concept provides an important strategy to improve the lives of all species. Animals suffer from many of the same diseases as people, and therefore new therapies would benefit all species. Animal and plant health improve people's physical, mental, social, and environmental health, and a healthy environment really benefits everybody. Animal health professionals should work with human health professionals to prevent zoonotic disease transmission, especially in high-risk groups that rely on pets for mental and social well-being. Asanteni sana for your time, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, and I hand it over to the moderator. Asanteni sana. Wow, thank you so much uh, to uh, Dr. Wangoi Mudigani uh, from the Ministry of Health there. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope you too, uh, from that background, uh, you know, uh, about uh, vaccines and how animal health and um, uh, people or human health is related. And it's it's it beats logic, uh, like those early days just being taken as when, and in 20th century, uh, when we have had a lot of uh, uh, you know advances in medicine, is when we have diverged, and now. Uh, I think um, uh, the diseases, the environment, every, everything is telling us to uh, to treat these as, as one. I should add that Dr. Wangoi Modigani uh, works at the Ministry of Health uh, under Universal Health uh, Coverage Secretariat, and she's the Kenya Primary Health Care Kenya Primary Health Care Lead, and that's why she's passionate about having one health, you know, under that uh, primary health care, uh, which will help us even in uh, achieving. Uh, universal health coverage. Uh, kindly put your questions uh, on Q&A, as I've said, uh, even from uh, to Dr. Wangoi, I'll share with her, and we'll be able to, to forward the questions to her. I have her, um, uh, she, was, she was not able uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, combine uh, the presentation with her video, uh, but we have the presentation and we'll share as a resource email uh, with all the other resources we have. Right now, uh, allow me to bring our second uh, presenter for this evening, uh, who I introduced earlier as Dr. Gladys uh, Kalema Zikusoka, uh, the founder and chief executive officer of conservation through public health. Uh, she tell us more about herself and the work she does uh, uh, to promote uh, public health uh, and also in relation to human health. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kalema, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me today for this webinar. Um, I apologize, my presentation may be a bit long, but I'll try and make it within 10 minutes. Um, I just wanted to know how long is the webinar for? Yes, uh, we, we started in a bit ending? late. We started in a what bit time? late. It's, okay. it's, we wanted to end at half past uh, five, but we may, might be forced to go up to six. 
kindly I hope you're able to do 10 minutes. I'll probably do 15. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. We'll okay. give you that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um thank and the speech was very, very Um, I'm going to talk about the relationship between human, animal, and environmental health, or planetary health, as it's being called more recently. Uh, we founded Conservation Through Public Health as a One Health NGO in 2003, before people even were really talking about One Health as an approach. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about my One Health journey. I became an Ashoka Fellow for merging Uganda's wildlife management and rural public health programs to create common resources for people and animals. Ashoka supports leading social entrepreneurs with systems changing ideas. And I'm really glad that over the past, 20 years, one is really becoming recognized. Um, excuse me, uh, um, Dr. Kalama. And as you mentioned also during the COVID pandemic, um, people are beginning to understand on this issue. So that's how important it has become. I became a for a number of years. And really supported. I was appointed on the WHO. Oops. Hello, Dr. Kalema. Yes. I, I think we're losing you. Uh, I don't know if it's your side or my side. Oh. Uh, hmm. Yeah. That's all. We actually lost your presentation. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Let me try again. Okay. Yeah. Ken, strange. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Wait. Mm Yeah, I've confirmed it's your side. Uh, our our colleagues are saying they can't hear you as well. Yeah, because I try to use the office internet. Okay. Let me... okay. Uh, people, I see you putting questions on the chat. I kindly put the questions on the Q&A. Are we able to answer them better uh, from Q&A and also archive them? Um, ooh. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, maybe I'll just present without the, the video I, for now until I get- Yes, it. yes, please. But you can share the screen again. I, I think now you're very well audible. If you don't mind, can you start over? Briefly. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I- Okay, so I was just, uh, I don't know at what point I went off the screen, but I just wanted to say I've been on this One Health journey for 20 years now, um, based on experiences I had, starting as the first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority um, in 1996. And I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, when we investigated a disease in the gorillas, which came from people living around the park, I'm an Ashoka Fellow. I became an Ashoka Fellow for merging Uganda's wildlife management and rural public health programs to create common resources for people and animals. And I'm really pleased to also be a National Geographic Explorer. And last month, I was appointed on the WHO Scientific Advisory Group on Origins of Novel Pathogens, based on the work that we do in the community and working in wildlife-rich habitats. I'm pleased that 
really pleased to announce that this week I was, a, I was given an award by the United Nations Champions of the Earth Award for its uh, to us role in science and innovation around the environmental space, which we're really excited about. And they were really happy about our One Health approach to conservation, which they feel is making a big difference in helping people to live and coexist with nature. The, you mentioned the part about mitigating COVID, and this presentation is talking, going to talk about that, but also other diseases that we're mitigating. Um, the pandemic, breaking zoonotic disease transmission through One Health approaches, learning to respect nature and wildlife, reducing deforestation and habitat encroachment, improving animal welfare, sustainable management. And there's a big debate about banning or regulating wildlife trade based of where COVID possibly came from. In my presentation, I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing over the years um, to prevent disease from people to animals and from animals to people. There's just over 1,000 mountain gorillas left in the world. And even if there's just 1,000, the numbers have actually grown over time. When I first started working with them, they're only about 650, and they've almost doubled over the years. They are found in two populations, which are surrounded by a lot of high human population growth. So habitat loss and poaching is one of the biggest threats to gorillas wherever they're found all over Africa. They're found in 10 countries in Africa. And when you come to Bwindi Pentrobo National Park, where the, where the gorillas are that I'm mainly been working with, which is in that part of the forest, you find the hard edge. It's also the same at the Virungas. And gorillas sometimes come out, but people are no longer allowed to go in unless they're going in for tourism or research or other controlled community activities. But however, poaching is still an issue all over, but poaching especially for um, a deca and bush pig in Uganda, because people don't eat gorilla meat in Uganda and Rwanda. But in other parts of the Africa, Africa, people still think that eating great is as strong as a gorilla or a chimp. So it's actually a delicacy. But however, because we're so closely related, um, we share over 98% genetic material. In, we did some interesting and this disease outbreak. Uh, Dr. Gladys, we're still losing you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we're okay. still losing you. Uh, yeah. Let me, let me, um, can you hear me now? Very well, yeah, loud and clear. Uh, I really don't know, but I can go back to where I stopped, but yes. um, I'm very sorry about that. I don't know what's happening with internet today. Yesterday was very good, today uh, it's it not. It does happen sometimes, yeah, we understand. Um, mm -hmm. more than that, I'll, I'll keep going. Oh, no, it's mm -hmm. um, I'll continue where I left off. Uh, I think this okay. is where. I, did you see this part here about the disease in the gorillas? This disease came from people living around the park who have very little health care. And this happened when I was working as a first vet for the Wildlife Authority. And I was hired because they were concerned about zoonotic disease transmission from tourists to gorillas. But the actual first disease came from the local community living around the park. They got it when they went outside the park to eat people's banana plants. Um, because before habituation, they had a fear of people and they never used to go outside the park. But once they lost their fear of people, they went back to their former ranges, which had actually been taken up by 
high human population growth and people cutting right up to the habitat. Um, people and gorillas also get to pick up diseases from each other when they share with water sources. These gorillas are crossing uh, a dam that was put in the forest to provide water for the local community and cattle also defecating it further up just outside the park. And so we set up CTPH to keep the gorillas healthy and their habitat secure. And when we come to visit us, you see this very nice view from our office. And within this forest is not only gorillas, but there's chimpanzees, forest elephants, chimpanzees, elephants, actually not forest elephants, um, savanna elephants, which happen to be in the forest. They used to be maybe connected to Queen Elizabeth National Park, which I'm gonna talk about later in my presentation. But also here you have, you know, six species of monkeys, butterflies, birds, and it's a very important water catchment area and a climate modulator. So our integrated programs include wildlife conservation, the focus on health, community health, and alternative livelihoods. We train people who to monitor the health of the gorillas when they're in people's land and also within the park, both the rangers and community volunteers called gorilla guardians, who uh, another name for them is human gorilla conflict resolution team because they had gorillas back whenever they come out. And we carry out comparative disease investigations between people, wildlife and livestock, looking at diseases they're sharing. This is Jadia, um, a disease which I have had a number of times and it causes vomiting and diarrhea. You feel like you're gonna die of dehydration, but we have found it in all people, gorillas and livestock. And over time, as we've improved community health, the Jadia and the gorillas has drastically reduced, which we're really pleased about. Because when they go to people's gardens, they also find that people have openly defecated. And now more and more people are developing hand washing stations and having toilets. And this is our Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center, built with support from Task Trust. And here we're able to analyze all kinds of diseases. These are students from UK and US studying entamoeba, uh, coli, which is another protozoa, stress hormones. And they're being trained by our another founder member of CTPH. Mr. Steven Rubanga, who's our chief vet technician. And in this way, we are actually able to tell the local authorities when they give us the human samples to educate communities not to collect water from unprotected sources where we found Jadia in the community, rather than just treating them for diarrhea diseases, they're able to find out what is actually causing it. And, and by treating the people and by digging cattle water traps for the cattle to drink from, this reduces the level of spread to gorillas and it prevents disease transmission between the three. So these brochures were developed in my last year at the Wildlife Authority when everybody got concerned that gorillas were picking up all kinds of diseases from people. And in this, I, it was the beginning of my One Health journey engaging people. We found that we needed to start training community volunteers to do conservation work. Um, and we started doing training community health workers to do conservation work. This lady is giving a presentation in her community, talking about how to prevent zoonotic disease transmission, how to have a manageable family size, and what to do if gorillas come to your garden. You call the gorilla guardians to herd them out before people get hurt, and gorillas get hurt or pick up diseases from each other. So through this, we focus on hygiene and sanitation. We prevent and control infectious diseases. Right now we're focusing on COVID, TB and other respiratory diseases, as well as scabies, which is the first disease to spread from people to gorillas, HIV and diarrhea diseases. We are promoting voluntary family planning so people can have manageable families. This one isn't a manageable family. The children are all from the same family and they're almost all the same size. They promote nutrition, sustainable agriculture, report homes visited by gorillas so people can come and herd them away quickly. There's a heightened awareness on zoonotic disease and the importance of the gorillas and the forest and how to benefit from ecotourism. They also give family planning injections to enable people to have a manageable family size. And this has really helped because women are no longer having babies every year. They can actually do something else with their lives. They have more all over their bodies and the men are better able to balance the family budget. So in, in the end, this helps the conservation of the wildlife and really helps the community well-being. We are sustaining our volunteers through village health and conservation teams with group livelihood projects, such as goats and cows, which they're reinvesting into village saving and loan associations. 
So over the years, we are pleased to have seen the growth of the mountain gorilla population. I participated in the first census here in uh, 1997 for Bwindi mountain gorillas. And this is all a concerted effort of the government, Uganda Wildlife Authority, plus all the different NGOs that have come in. Ours began in 2003. There are others that were there before us, but primarily improving the health of the gorillas by providing immediate veterinary care and monitoring their health over time, improving the health of the communities. And when you improve their health, they're more likely to protect the wildlife. Improving their health and well being has had a very, very big factor in the growth of the gorilla population. And this has been done through tourism, improving healthcare, and also improving research and law enforcement. So all of this has helped and would like it to happen in other countries where gorillas are found in Africa, where it's the opposite, the populations are going down. Um, gorilla tourism is a big activity, which brings a, a lot of benefits and financial res returns for the area, and it supports park operations in Uganda, actually not only Windy, but other places. And people are always still to be seven meters away from the gorillas, which they are over here. But we found that over time, they've broken the regulations. And 60% of the time, the tourists have break the rules. 40% of the time, the gorillas break the rules. And this became a bigger issue when the COVID-19 pandemic began, um, which has now affected millions of people and jumped to animals. As you mentioned, we still don't know which is the origin of COVID. It's still a big debate and a lot of scientific, scientific studies are being done to find out the actual cause. But, but coronaviruses have been implicated in previous pandemics, which were not as big as COVID, but there were pandemics as well. And so there's SARS, which happened in 2003, and that was in Southeast Asia. A few countries, it only happened, it didn't go beyond Southeast Asia, and the intermediate host was found to be a cat, but it was a bat coronavirus. And MERS, which is a Middle East respiratory syndrome, was also found in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, and the immediate host was found to be a dromedary camel. So with SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID, we're still trying to find out what the origin is, and if there is an intermediate host, and that will really help in addressing and preventing the spread of COVID, but also looking at how to prevent other diseases. Uh, the captive lowland gorillas in zoos in 2021 got COVID. So did captive lions and tigers, and most recently captive hippos, farmed mink in Denmark and Netherlands, and also wild deer in USA, the first wild animals which have been reported to have antibodies of COVID in their blood. And that's another example of how it's happening. But to try and prevent such things happening in Uganda, and although they've happened in other countries later, very early in the COVID pandemic, we immediately worked closely with the Wildlife Authority and other conservation NGOs and made sure that they upgraded the great egg viewing regulations. People never used to have to wear masks. Now they have to wear masks. The distance has to be longer than 10 meters. I mean, between just to be seven meters, now it has to be, you can't see the gorillas at less than 10 meters. I mean, that's the ideal. And there's more sanitation, hand washing, boot disinfection, and now they take your temperature. It's not enough to just show that you're not, that you're not looking sick. And this has really helped to reduce the spread of COVID because it, it got everywhere, but it's really helped to reduce the spread of COVID to the endangered mountain gorillas. So in the communities, we developed these brochures um, where we added a gorillas onto this one that's developed for humans. And through this, we've been able to prevent disease transmission. People know that if the gorillas are in their garden, they call the gorilla guardians who wear masks, which we provided for the rangers, the gorilla guardians, the village health and conservation teams, and they safely had the gorillas back without causing any problem between the two of them. So we've continued to train them in COVID mitigation. These are village health and conservation teams. And, but unfortunately, there was a setback when a silverback gorilla was killed by a poacher and his group actually split up after this. And this poacher, as I said, was not going for the gorilla, but for the bushmeat and the dica. These are also a source of, these can also be a source of disease outbreaks, zoonotic disease outbreaks in people. Just by eating bushmeat, you can pick up all kinds of things. But this particular poacher was hungry. Um, there's no tourists coming in, no money coming in the community. And he dared to go in and he actually succeeded in killing the gorilla when the gorilla charged when he spared a bush pig. This was a very sad day for conservation. 
Um, he got 11 years in jail, which is the longest anyone has ever had. But in the process of this, we thought, how can we help the local communities to provide, you know, to stop poaching? Because he poached because he was hungry. So we started to provide fast growing seedlings to the most vulnerable communities living around the habitat, including his wife, because we went to see her afterwards. But people like that who fit that profile of they're very poor and they're desperate. That we started to engage the reform poachers who had stopped poaching, but now because tourism was not there anymore during the pandemic, they, they were beginning to go back because they had no other way to survive. You know, they were not earning any living as porters or you know, selling crafts to the tourists and they went back. Um, the Batwa community who used to live in the park and all the vulnerable communities managed to get some fast growing seedlings which were able to give them something to eat. And now that tourism is coming back, they can actually always have something to eat. And tourism is only just additional income to their normal household needs. We also continue to engage coffee farmers, although the main customers were tourists, they were no longer coming. So what we did is we managed to look for markets outside in the UK and more in Kenya, Safari Lounge, UK Manero Beans, in order to be able to keep them going during the pandemic. But other disease outbreaks, so the pandemic showed us that you can't just depend on tourism, but tourism is an opportunity to sustain conservation. And how do we prevent disease transmission between people, wildlife, people and wildlife. And other disease outbreaks that have affected wildlife and people and their livelihoods are anthrax, which I'm going to talk about. And there's Marburg, which came from bats in, in Uganda, living in mines and at Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, some people died through contact with bat feces. Brucellosis is quite common, unfortunately, in the communities where we work, because people drink milk, which is not boiled. Um, tuberculosis is also common in some areas. People eat meat, which isn't inspected, and they can pick up TB. Rift Valley fever is another disease you can get through contact with cattle. We've also seen it in buffalo. We've seen brucellosis, tuberculosis, and Rift Valley fever in the buffaloes. We also do studies in them. Um, Rinderpest is another one, foot and mouth disease, and contagious bovine pleural pneumonia. So actually, all these diseases are found in wildlife, livestock, and people. So anthrax outbreaks have occurred and affected wildlife and people in Africa. This is Queen Elizabeth National Park where there's it's a big fishing community and many hippos are inside this lake. So in 2010, there was a report of a high mortality of hippos. Earlier than that in 2004, there was even a higher mortality of hippos. So we joined the National Disease Task Force in order to address this issue. And this is what we found. Hippos were in the water together with people inside the same water, um, swimming and very, very highly likely to pick up diseases from the hippos just by swimming with them, if not getting harmed by them. And they started to die over here in the Shambura Gorge, in Queen Elizabeth National Park. So the first thing that happened is the Wildlife Authority, as part of the members of the task force, started to bury hippos in 2010. They started to bury them and bury them with lime to prevent further spread. We did community sensitization to get people not to eat meat from unknown sources, not to eat meat from hippos that have died or sources in the market because they could get anthrax. And if they'd ever had anthrax in the previous outbreak, which resulted in a few people dying and many, many people getting sick. Luckily, anthrax is treatable and they were able to be treated. And we hope to create a group of community animal health workers to do this. We held a number of workshops, with a, that's the Community Conservation Warden, Wilson. We carried out participatory epidemiology to find out what is the best way, what they think about anthrax and diseases in general, and zoonotic disease, and what is the best way to reach them to change their perceptions. And we found out that many women perceive themselves to be at risk of anthrax from their spouses, who could be hunters or pastoralists. The, there was a significant preference for formal health services as opposed to traditional healers when, when it came to anthrax. They thought that it's a disease that can be treated through local herbs. And they, were, they only reported for healthcare when they were very sick. But one thing we found is that the level of knowledge changed according to the area where they were. The closer they were to the park, the more that they understood about it. 
and they preferred social mobilization um, rather than radio to be reached at. So we continue to build up our community conservation animal health workers to reach them with critical health information, just like we had done at Windy. And part of their messages included the dangers of eating beef from unknown sources um, and poaching, having better health seeking behavior, improving hygiene and sanitation, drinking, not drinking water from the lake, um, and trying to avoid their cattle sharing sources with wildlife and their cattle grazing with wildlife. We worked closely with a number of groups and we were fortunate to be funded by MacArthur Foundation and USAID in Emerging Pandemic Threats Respond. But through this, we also engaged with UCC because they helped us with developing a disease communication platform, which my husband being a founder member of CTPH helped to set that up. And we also worked with the government agencies, which are all part of the National One Health Platform that, that Dr. Professor Dr. Wangui talked about earlier. So some of the lessons we've learned from the anthrax outbreak is that in 2004, over 300 hippos died. Buffalo and other wildlife were affected significantly. Over 200 people got sick, six people died and had a negative impact on livelihoods and ecosystems as well as tourism. In 2010, we we're a bit more knowledgeable and hippos were buried quickly before they could spread, spread through the park. Over hundred hippos died and not so many buffalo died. There was no human deaths. There's very little spread to people and livestock. The livestock can actually be vaccinated and they're vaccinated ahead of time. Um, the task force had started to work now multidisciplinary um, with health, agriculture and wildlife together. And there was quick barrier of hippos with Lyme and there's a lot of social mobilization and there was a reduced negative impact. So one health approaches really work. So by talking about why we're advocating for COVID-19 vaccination, because we find that by vaccinating wildlife, we prevent, by vaccinating um, people, we prevent, disease, we prevent uh, COVID spreading to the wildlife and coming back to the people in a variant or strain that can be treated or vaccinated against. And so we were part of a USAID funded study to, we contributed to this study to understand the uptake of vaccine in wildlife communities and came up with very interesting findings, which were presented at the Africa CDC conference in 2021. And generally they didn't think it was a serious issue until the second wave of COVID occurred. And they felt that they, would, they preferred social mobilization again than radio broadcasts and TV broadcasts. So what we did is we made sure all our staff were vaccinated and we, we posted it on social media and showed it to the communities which encouraged them to also go for vaccination. And we carried out a lot of vaccination campaigns around Windy and we got a lot of people vaccinated as a result. So we, we advocated for the park staff to be among the first people to be vaccinated and we strengthened great aid viewing guidelines with other partners, including IUCN and the great aid pathology specialist group. And we continue to advocate for increased uptake of vaccine. We developed a policy brief with International Gorilla Conservation Program and Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance to talking about all these issues. And this policy brief is for all the countries in Africa with great apes and 13 of them which have great ape tourism at 33 sites. Responsible tourism, preventing disease transmission, not getting too close to the animals, wearing masks, vaccinating where you can, but also supporting the communities. And we also carried out a social media campaign more recently, we developed a website, which I'll encourage you to visit because it has a lot of inform important information about preventing zoonotic disease transmission. Um, for more information, please visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gladys Kalema uh, for that really, really incisive and in-depth um, presentation and for you of, um, what do I call it? For thinking uh, that you started this uh, before uh, One Health has, you know, has become, you know, like, um, you know, like a thing, you know, we're not talking about it uh, from governments to the media. Uh, there are a few questions, but please allow me uh, to take all of these questions after all uh, our speakers. And uh, right now I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Noel Sitati, uh, my good friend uh, who works with, with uh, WWF Tanzania, 
and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Noah, uh, do you have um, uh, mm -hmm. a PowerPoint presentation? Dr. Gladys, we come to yeah. you as, as we, we, we finish up with the two speakers and then we'll take questions as a panel. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Prof. Sitati uh, is a uh, wildlife species uh, expert and he'll tell us if uh, human activities are putting us into threat uh, of these zoonotic diseases and what we need to do as a media. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. If you could put it into presentation mode. Okay. There we go. Yeah. All right. Then you can see me as well. I can. <laughs> Good to see you. Okay, thank you. you. Uh, very well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm in the field. I hope uh, there will be no big issue with the connectivity. Uh, my name is uh, Noah Sitati. I work for WWF Tanzania Country Office as an expert to do with the species uh, work uh, supporting our transboundary uh, program between Kenya and Tanzania, as well as uh, between Tanzania and, uh, and Mozambique. Uh, I'm a member of the IUCN. Uh, I'm sure many of you know IUCN, which is an international organization uh, that works in the field of uh, nature conservation as well as sustainable use. Um, a member of the uh, elephant specialist group, uh, which is the highest body uh, decision-making body on elephant issues. And you know, of course, elephants do also have uh, diseases that are transmitted to uh, to people, livestock, and, and so on. I'm also a member of the sustainable, uh, I said sustainable use in livelihoods. And uh, our previous uh, our presenter, Gladys, just talked about uh, livelihood options that make people, uh, you know, to uh, to engage into bushmeat. I'm also a member of the Bioparma. Bioparma is a biodiversity and uh, protected areas uh, uh, management program, uh, technical uh, advisor. It's a program that runs across IUCN as well. And then lastly, I'm also a member of the Species Monitoring Specialist Group uh, that looks at all species across the globe and providing technical I think we're losing you. Prof. Of, uh, uh, support for decision making. Uh, okay. Excuse uh, yeah, me, I can Prof. See the internet. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please. yes. Yeah, if you could be off video, we save on bad with the guest. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. I can hear you now. Uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, and it's not moving. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. all yeah. right okay there we are yeah so of course in the field of species work uh we've seen a big threat in terms of uh zoonotic diseases being passed over to uh, people to um animals wildlife uh, as well as domestic animals and of course, that depends also on the environment, as we had from the first uh, video, which was very, very well presented. I don't want to go back into that. But this basically to do with wildlife consumption, uh, you know, which is quite high. It could be legal consumption. It could be um, a legal consumption. Illegal means like in, in, in Tanzania, uh, you know, hunting is allowed where permits are issued, and of course, many other countries. But then there's also a lot of illegal uptake of you know, bushmeat uh, that is happening uh, across, across the country, not just Tanzania. I've seen even Uganda, uh, Kenya is quite a big problem as well, and many other African countries. And the big reason behind it is, uh, of course, poverty, you know, livelihoods, uh, which again, of course, uh, uh, was uh, uh, more or less uh, messed up uh, during the COVID-19 
you know, uh, pandemic where people were pushed back uh, into sort of poverty and they resorted back to, you know, bushmeat as a source of, you know, revenue or income and of course food. And there's also destruction of uh, nature uh, because when you talk about one health system, it's an, an integrated process that looks at, you know, people, uh, animals, as well as the environment as we had. So any destruction uh, that we do, uh, which is going on a lot in most of the countries, uh, that is one of the major causes uh, to do with the pandemics. And the increasing human population, of course, that means the chances of people and animals coming closer, you know, is, is quite high. And that increases the, the risk of spread of, of the diseases. And of course, uh, we have poaching or illegal wildlife trade that has been a crusade. Uh, uh, animal products like, you know, trophies, uh, uh, ivory from elephants, uh, rhino horns, how they are taken by the poachers, you know, not really considering, um, you know, hygiene. Uh, because they know they are staying, they can be found, they can be shot. So just quickly taking up these products that are still with blood and, you know, uh, transporting them, that also increases the chances of uh, infection. So all this uh, boils down to the interaction between people, wildlife, as well as uh, the environment. So uh, when I discussed with the people, of course, uh, about the media, I know we've been involved in this media before, um, the importance of using media uh, to share, uh, you know, the risks that are associated with zoonotic diseases and possibly suggest uh, ways on how this uh, can be tackled and especially uh, involving the media. Uh, recently, we are out together on a trip to Mkomazi in, in Tanzania. And uh, I'm quite happy to report that, uh, you know, the reports that have come out of the media by different media uh, channels that we had are quite encouraging and really talking more about um, you know natural capital and its value uh, and the importance of uh, conserving. So out of this we expect to see really increased uh, understanding of the root causes already uh, from the two presenters. I mean they've been quite uh, detailed and very clear and understandable uh, that uh, we can make it much simpler for the media uh, I know uh, sometimes when you put too much science again, and then uh, the reporting becomes a bit limited. So we need to also put in a way that the media, you know, fraternity can also be able to put in a language that everybody else uh, can understand. The problem with the scientists is that we write very scientific, hard, you know, uh, uh, information that it becomes difficult to really share with even lay people. Uh, but here, you know, having the media, uh, you know, translate that into something that is uh, easy to understand and usable by everybody, then that should be a way of helping us to uh, mitigate these uh, problems that we are facing from the Nordic diseases. So ultimately, we are looking at behavior change uh, because people here are killing lots of wildlife for bushmeat, which is not inspected. And of course, they always say they've done it for many, many years and they've never had problems before, but they are not sure because people die in the villages without sometimes knowing, you know, what has actually killed them. So it could be some of these, you know, diseases that are transmitted from the wildlife that they eat, you know, uh, which is uh, not inspected. So behavior change then becomes critical and that will promote, of course, some overwhelming support that we need to, uh, to, to, to consider. Uh, in terms of the use of bushmeat, we have both large-scale commercial hunting where meat is taken to urban areas. We also have hunting where there are threatened species which are targeted. We have what we call opportunistic chances or accidental uh, because the poachers could snares as you can see in the wild, and these snares can catch anything, including livestock, as we have seen in most of the areas. So the indiscriminate snaring, it becomes really a big cause of uh, livestock, I mean, wildlife mortality. And we also seeing lots of livestock uh, being caught into the snares 
and and lost to you know sometimes to wildlife because they cannot uh, really defend themselves when they're in the wild with other wildlife. So in this case, we consider that the outsiders are actually exploiting the resources of the indigenous people and local communities. Uh, I'll give that example. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, we have a program that we are targeting in the urban areas where the youths go into the villages to hunt and then bring it to urban areas and the women will do the selling of the meat. And that means, uh, you know, the local people who are supposed to be utilizing these resources for tourism are after losing, you know, their resource without knowing, and eventually they lose that opportunity uh, for, for tourism. I don't know whether you are hearing me. It's a bit of, it's raining heavily outside. I'm trying to shout from this end. It's, yes, can I, we hear can hear you. you. Uh, yes, ah, I can. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So a number of diseases, I don't want to go over that. Uh, because already Gladys has, you know, taken us very well uh, through the various diseases that uh, you know, are transmitted from uh, wildlife to humans. And more recently is a COVID-19, which has remained very controversial. Uh, the initial theory was that it was actually from bats, but then the ICN bats group have denied, you know, written a very strong statement that their, their bats are not the ones that actually, you know, caused uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19. So it still remains a myth. Where did it begin from? And uh, of course, there are other thoughts that uh, it could have been pangolin as well. And there's a lot of pangolin in Africa that is being taken to Asia. And most of those scales are used uh, for different purposes. So both whether it's illegal or illegal is another way of spreading uh, the the, the uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, we have rabies, we have malignant cattle, especially the wildebeests when they migrate from Serengeti uh, to Masai Mara, you'll find the Masai is moving their livestock away uh, because they know they bring, uh, the wildebeests bring uh, some disease that cause miscarriage in, you know, in livestock. So that already in cell is a form of conflict uh, between you know the local uh, Maasai who are herders, livestock herders, and uh, you know uh, wildlife. And what we have seen in some places is Maasai is now trying to put fences, you know, around their areas to keep the wildebeest away. But then they also get entangled in those fences and die. And we've seen cases where uh, they go spearing the wildebeest because they, they don't want them. And it's the same place where tourism is being promoted again. So then it becomes really tricky. How do we balance all these? You know, we want tourism, we want animals for tourism, but when they come, they bring diseases and communities who are benefiting from tourism are not happy and again, spearing the same, the same animals. Yeah, so those are some of the, uh, the challenges that we, we, we experienced. The other one that we had in Tanzania, the Kana in December, which is a viral uh, infection that killed men lions and dogs. And there was a massive uh, dog vaccination uh, program in the Serengeti and the bit of Masai Mara, uh, just to control you know, the spread of the Kana in December, which was killing uh, lots of lions some, some years back. So that becomes another threat when it comes to uh, the uh, spread of the zoonotic diseases uh, from uh, animals to uh, domestic, you know, I mean, from wildlife to domestic animals. So bushmeat also is a, a transboundary issue. Uh, uh, today, we're just talking about somebody who was arrested. He, uh, he goes to um, Tanzania uh, to kill, I mean, wildlife, and then crosses over to Kenya to sell uh, the meat and this meat is not inspected. And that, again, can explain why the disease can spread very easily uh, across the transboundary. So transboundary intervention, monitoring, and checks on both sides of the border, and then also becomes uh, very key. And many of you, you remember uh, the challenges that were there between uh, the two countries uh, during the COVID-19, where the borders were shut and, uh, you know, 
uh, the tensions and the uh, uh, business uh, crumpled and, and so on. And of course, uh, Tanzania uh, didn't believe so much in, uh, in COVID-19, uh, which was a very strong factor, you know, when it came to uh, decision making. And uh, now under a different uh, regime, now we are seeing the government really accepting, uh, you know, COVID-19 and uh, having a strong campaign uh, to uh, educate the people and even persuade them to, uh, to take the vaccine. Of course, the adoption rate of vaccine is still very low. I'm sure it's just about three, uh, maybe 3%. Three people still believe uh, on what they were told initially by the former regime, that uh, you know, this is something that will wipe out the population uh, in Africa. So as you can see, very good work that is being done in Uganda by Gladys, you know, really strong campaign, but on our side, that has been a little bit of a challenge uh, until we get really good, uh, you know, political will. So what I'm trying to stress here is that uh, uh, political will is really key when it comes to, you know, uh, a proper handling of uh, one health approach uh, to be able to control the spread, the infection, and also, you know, uh, mortalities of people, wildlife, and so on because it then eventually it becomes an international uh, sort of problem. And uh, uh, politically, as you know, uh, when ESC called for a meeting for East African countries, uh, Tanzania didn't attend. Uh, of course, nobody could raise a finger. Uh, even journalists could not say anything at that time. And that's what I'm talking about. Every time I meet journalists, I always tell them you need to be uh, very, very open and frank, but sometimes, you know, you, you fear for your life. Uh, and that was the case. But now there's a bit of freedom of expression and people can now be able to say the things that they never had an opportunity to say uh, during the, the previous regime. Now we have a project called uh, Connect, which is a transboundary program that is being implemented uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Uh, it's a USAID funded program uh, through traffic, ESC, WWF, and IUCN. And it's focusing on illegal wildlife crimes. And we chose on Tanzania side uh, two urban areas that are close to the border that's Longido and Manga, where we targeted women and youth just to understand why they engage in illegal wildlife crime, especially to do with. Uh, uh, with Bushmeat. Yeah, so it was not easy to really bring these people together because they know it's illegal and they thought they're going to be arrested. Uh, but then we had to be very smart and use their leaders to really convince them to come forward. And, you know, um, meet us. we had um, a good workshop, a good training. Now they understand. And we are supporting them to uh, improve their livelihoods, just like uh, what we had from, you know, uh, Dr. Gladys. So we have provided beehives so that they start beekeeping program. Uh, like today is when we are handing over the beehives to them and the honey processing machines. And they have a very good slogan on how they are going to address anybody that is involved in bushmeat uh, in the urban areas. So the men who go to hunt have said they are not going to hunt anymore. And the women who have been, you know, selling, you see them carrying buckets on their head. You might think it's water, but it's all full of gamut. And they have also what not to, uh, uh, to engage anymore in uh, illegal uh, wildlife uh, uh, crimes or trade or business that they've been doing. So, you know, providing alternatives for their livelihood, some business environment will actually change their behavior. And as we can see, already somebody has been arrested because of this team providing information uh, to the relevant authority, uh, anybody that is seen within the vicinity are uh, trying to sell Bushmen. So the concept here is that, you know, use a thief to catch a thief. It has never been used before uh, in, in our country um, and people were, you know, skeptical about it, but now they are very happy because we are not using the police anymore or, you know, the uh, range.
just to go around and you know patrolling uh, because they already have eyes on the ground uh, you know to uh, severe for them and be able to tell anybody uh, that uh, may uh, get involved in illegal wildlife crimes. So that's a very successful sort of story that we are seeing, and we plan to do a lot more for uh, for the groups. The women want to grow vegetables, uh, which are easy and faster to generate, you know, uh, income. They are starting uh, organized uh, women groups. They are registered already, and now they are looking for supporters. And today the government votes to give them uh, some money now that they're legally registered uh, so that they can enhance their livelihoods. So this has been sort of an area that uh, people were not very sure that, you know, when you bring the people involved in bushmeat, whether they really change and stop this behavior. Uh, but uh, quite a number of studies have shown that, yes, it works as long as you offer food and income to uh, you know, these people, and that will reduce household hunting as well as consumption. So that's our focus. And of course, the project also predicted reduction in hunting and consumption. That's what we, we hope to see ultimately. And also the designer should consider how culturally accepted and alternatives offered is. Sometimes some of these animals have cultural you know, attachments or beliefs. Uh, Tanzania, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, witchcraft, uh, which of course animal parts are also used. Uh, a lot of research has been done by traffic and that is very clear that actually it is there. Uh, people keeping snakes and many different types of animals, but then they don't know that these animals might also be carrying some, you know, uh, diseases that can be transmitted to to people. The biggest question we've been asking ourselves is why are people not really affected by, you know, these disease infections as much as they live very closer to, uh, to, to the animals and they actually feed on these animals? That has always been a question that has not been answered. But then one health approach is relatively new. It has been there. Yes, a few years back, I saw Tanzania has a One Health uh, plan which expired and now we are pushing uh, for a review. Uh, and what I want to say is that conservation organizations worked in, in silos. We never uh, sort of thought about you know, zoonotic diseases for long. And I'm happy again with the, uh, what Gladys presented. I think I've listened to them before. And I really like the work that they've done with the gorillas because they are very close to humans and disease transmission becomes you know, very easy. And those are really you know, prestigious animals that we cannot afford to lose. The approach is quite good. And we also are trying to take that direction, but for you know, the general uh, wildlife uh, uh, species. Now, uh, what can we do as a media? What a sort of uh, observation can we uh, uh, I use as a media, we need to create awareness, uh, make sure that people are educated and ensure that we are using all sorts of channels. I think that's crucial, very important. Uh, newspapers, radio, television, and you know, with radio, it should be sometimes go down to the you know local stations, not just national you know stations that people are now fond of listening to. You know, so we have a more comprehensive communication, a sort of strategy on how this information uh, can be passed over to to people, uh, because as much as they know, for example, that COVID nineteen was caused by wildlife, but here they still go and you know continue um, hunting. And then special editions, working with the with the media on how to produce special editions. We did one for uh, Socknot, which was really good and it has gone out. Uh, people have seen and uh, they know now there's a program that is looking at uh, human health vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, bushmeat. Capacity development. We always work in isolation from the media. Uh, that's another important area. How do we bring the media close to us? Uh, so that we build a capacity on environmental issues. You know, uh, to me that is really crucial, uh, so that they understand and be able to transcribe that information into a language that can be easily understood by the common 
uh, people, the common manaingi, and give them a bit of treats to go to conservation areas just to have a feel uh, of what happens in the field. Uh, some areas are very intact, some areas are completely gone. And of course, uh, destruction of the environment is also key when it comes to uh, disease transmission uh, because we are moving closer to the wildlife. And the destruction is because of unsustainable uh, agricultural practices that are happening. Uh, people do not know what exactly they want. And the farming is more or less like you know, random and try and error approach. In the event of climate change, what you are seeing uh, in terms of uh, droughts and floods, then the farmers are losing almost everything. So mitigation or adapt adaptation to climate uh, change impact then it also becomes key. And more importantly, a sustainable food production system that we need to consider. What has been happening with agriculture, what I would say uh, it's the biggest threat to conservation is because of habitat destruction and closure of corridors that we are experiencing. When the animals come, they find the routes they used to use are completely closed and they now venture into human settlements and that becomes an easy way of transmitting diseases. Yeah, so through a program, uh, what we call Southern Kenya Northern Tanzania program, we are trying to see how we can secure the corridors uh, between the two countries. And uh, uh, that uh, is happening uh, through what we call integrated approach, you know, working with the farmers, working with everybody that we think is important when it comes to, you know, securing corridors. But more importantly, is ensuring that uh, we have, you know, benefits to the communities that will improve, you know, their livelihoods. Some of the challenges that we face include, of course, corruption, uh, when it comes to enforcement of wildlife comes, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the rangers are compromised and uh, they, you know, just allow people to go away with bushmeat. That has happened at all levels. There's lack of education and awareness about the disease. We need to do a lot of that now uh, because- uh, Sorry, Pro, said, I'll give you two minutes to wrap up, Pro. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there's also weak enforcement. Okay that has been happening and uh, lack of benefits for the communities that they don't see the value of, uh, of conservation. Uh, there are limited business opportunities. So they look at bushmeat as a main sort of uh, uh, source of income. Poverty level is very high in these areas. The existence of black markets to sell uh, the animal products and generally the cultural beliefs, uh, witchcraft, uh, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. These are the biggest challenges that we, we, we are seeing. So that's the only way we can win the war on zoonotic diseases. Here is a group that uh, we took to uh, Komazi. At the end of the day, we are all happy, the media fraternity and the ecologists all really happy to see that we're working together and moving the journey together. Thank you very much. Uh, together possible. Asante San. Thank you, Prof. It's uh, good to see familiar and familiar people. Uh, that was you know, a great uh, presentation like the rest we've had. Uh, and uh, I think Emma on chat says, I'm totally blown away from what I am learning. Thank you for the good work. I think you did learn a lot. And I like the call of action uh, to the media to be able to understand, you know, uh, this relationship better and diseases uh, so that uh, they can tell the story better. And also uh, what you've said about, you know, capacity building and basically that's what we're doing here. That's what we do at internews at authjournalism.net, you know, giving, uh, reporters the information that they need uh, so that they can tell these stories like this uh, new story about one health and uh, i like that picture of the giraffe uh, it sees very far and you call it the journalist eyes so uh, that shows uh, how uh, powerful the media can be and speaking of which i want to bring someone with that journalistic eye uh, called elizabeth merab from the nation uh, to just give us now her perspective on her experience with one health and probably 
uh, appeal to us to be able to tell this story better and what tools we can use. Elizabeth, I'm really sorry, time is gone. I don't know if we have time for Q&A, if you could use less than 10 minutes and forgive me for that. You, the floor is yours. And mute, please. Yeah. Sorry, thank you, Kyundu. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Merab. I am a senior health and science journalist uh, working with Nation Media Group here in Kenya. Uh, we cover the East and uh, Central Africa, uh, really, with our news. So uh, we recently rebranded to Nation Africa. With uh, all the knowledge that the experts have given you this afternoon or this evening from wherever you are, I don't really need to water down what they've said, what uh, maybe just add a few things from a journalist perspective on um, some of the things that we can look out for as journalists who are covering this relatively new concept, um, given that uh, it's something that, uh, we are still learning uh, ways around it. Uh, there are people who have not heard about it uh, ever. There are others who've interacted with the, the word but don't know what it means. And there are some people who have interacted with the word, know what it means, but they've not covered it. So I'm not reinventing the wheel this afternoon. Uh, forgive me if I keep saying it this afternoon, it's afternoon in Nairobi, or it's late afternoon in Nairobi. So uh, I'll just walk you through the, some of the things that journalists can do to report better or to look out for when they're reporting on One Health uh, uh, topic, uh, the One Health topic, sorry. So the first thing, uh, as usual, is is uh, focusing on stories that give audiences information that they can use to help them and their health. And uh, when you're, uh, uh, the reason why I've chosen to start with uh, with focusing on stories that give audiences information that they can use to help them, is because uh, all the experts who've shown up today to interact with us have repeated uh, the concept that one health. Is an, is an interaction between the environment, animals, and people. So if people are going to embrace the concept of One Health and see why it's important for them to appreciate or treat animals better, knowing that uh, a disease can easily jump from an animal uh, and affect uh, a person, then they have to, the only way they can do this is by interacting uh, with the stories that appeal to them. And what I mean by this, of course, we've seen Dr. Gladys talk about how they've been able to transform uh, the local community's perspective uh, towards the gorillas they work with uh, by through the community health volunteers. But as journalists, we have a wider platform and we interact and share knowledge with wider audiences who are both professional and others who are lay and uh, the larger percentage of our audiences are lay audiences. So when, when somebody has to interact with your story, they want to see the so what factor. They want to appreciate the fact that uh, this story does, is not uh, at arm's length. They can see how easy it is for a bat in Congo uh, to affect them uh, or infect them with Ebola through uh, through disease outbreaks, you know. So the first example I have here is uh, Sitati's, uh, from Sitati's presentation. And he talked about uh, the wildebeest in Masai Mara. I'm sure many Kenyans and Tanzanians know about the wildebeest migration. And when you look at that and what he said about uh, how uh, the Maasai communities were moving and uh, their livestock every time there is this migration so that uh, they can avoid this disease uh, transmission between the animals and the, and the livestock. Then you begin to see your story shaping up as a journalist because you can easily travel to the Mara and, uh, and interview these communities that have been affected or even start from uh, looking for the experts and uh, talking about this uh, uh, this topic so that you can frame it. 
The second thing is about telling compelling stories. People focus stories are always compelling stories because uh, when when a story, when I have to relate to a story about HIV and AIDS, I, I may not be infected or affected, but I probably know someone who's affected or infected. And the same case applies in One Health. You may not know, uh, you may not know somebody who's lost their livestock uh, to a disease or their family uh, members to a disease, but uh, they may, uh, somebody else knows or somebody else has been affected directly. And you had story, uh, you had uh, about the presentation about uh, people dying from eating bushmeats, women perceiving themselves as highly vulnerable to getting anthrax from their spouses or hunters, people who are getting diseases from swimming in hippo infested rivers. You know, these are stories that begin to shape up and begin to give you a people focused story. And then um, as I move forward, the aspect of social media, we live in an era where social media consumes a large part of our lives. We cannot uh, wish away social media at this point in time. And with it comes the good and the bad. I always say as a journalist that I prefer looking at the good. And uh, in this aspect, I look at uh, the scientists who are on social media, who are sharing what they are doing, the, uh, the studies they are, uh, they are involved in, the data they are releasing, you know, and uh, I follow them up. I reach out to them through their DMs and uh, ask them if they can share those studies with me, if they can, uh, if they are willing to uh, to take part in an interview, so that we can follow up this story for uh, for a future article. And uh, one example I'll give you here is uh, of a Kemri professor. His name is Professor George Warimwe. On uh, December 2nd, coincidentally, he was giving a lecture at the Royal Society Africa Prize on how he's helping to fight diseases with cross species vaccination. And this mean, simply meant that he was he's trying, he's in the process of trying to get a, a vaccine or his team is trying to develop a vaccine that can be used to uh, on both humans and animals. The idea is really to see if uh, one vaccine can protect both humans and animals. And this is just drawn from the concept that the next disease, the, what the WHO likes calling the next disease X, um, is mostly predicted to, uh, scientists mostly predict that the next disease X like COVID will emanate from animals, you know? So uh, we cannot take away that fact that uh, probably it's time that uh, there are vaccines that would be used to protect both animals and human beings. And for me as a journalist, I see that as a story that had, had, uh, had uh, pursued, you know? Um, finally, I'd look at, uh, at incorporating official data and solution journalism. And here again, I'll go back to the presentations that our, uh, some of our, our panelists have talked about. And uh, our first panelist um, uh, gave some data that two thirds of, the, of diseases today have an association between humans and animals, that 75% of emerging diseases are, do, are zoonotic, meaning that they are emanating from animals. Uh, and the fact that there is environmental degradation, there is deforestation, there is climate change, all these things begin to shape up a, a story, a data story that you can actually do and visualize using for graphics to, to do a very interesting interactive story. And when you look at the solutions aspect, I bring it on board because uh, today, we don't just talk about journalism without offering solutions. We don't just highlight the problems and leave it at that. As, uh, for me, as a, as a journalist uh, nowadays, I try to, uh, to incorporate the aspect of solution journalism. And Sitati has really uh, touched uh, or talked about one of the solutions they're giving the local communities uh, in terms of uh, addressing or reducing human wildlife conflict by, I like what you said, using a thief to catch a thief concept. So these are some of the things that for me as a journalist already trigger uh, interest in covering 
uh, as a news aspect because I know when I look or I think about how my audience would perceive that story, I see them interacting with that uh, with that piece uh, of article better than just uh, uh, quoting a study and leaving at that uh, leaving it at that because at the end of the day you want your story to answer the so what factor. It's not just the who, the why, the when, the how. You want uh, your story to appeal to that person who wants to know, okay, so do, uh, the next disease will come from an animal, so what, why should I care, you know? So these are some of the things that I would just leave you with today. I wouldn't go further than that, Kiundu. Back to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Mera. Indeed, uh, you've covered uh, a lot. Uh, I like the story mapping, uh, this, uh, how you've given us uh, ideas, story ideas. Are there, the, I, I mean, all the presentations are packed with these. And definitely, the what question uh, is, you know, is, is accurate when it comes to journalism. And we always strive to answer that in our stories. And I also like a bit of solutions-based story. I wanted to mention that uh, in closing, uh, but, but you've done the work for me uh, because yes, we can't tell, uh, always tell the story of the problem. And here the problem is um, the way we relate with animals, you know, from uh, mistreating uh, to killing them for food, or even for, you know, like trafficking uh, the big game uh, for profit. Um, but, but what was the problem here? The problem is the people who live uh, with these animals, uh, close to these animals, probably are disenfranchised. And uh, both Dr. Gladys and Prof. Sitati have highlighted solutions that, that different organizations are doing uh, to, to make sure uh, that these communities are taken care of financially uh, so that they can, be, uh, they can learn to treat uh, these animals better and see uh, that the valuable, uh, more valuable alive uh, than dead. Thank you so much, all panelists, uh, for this. Now I'll quickly, we have about eight minutes, go to the Q&A and see if we can answer two or three questions. Uh, if you're not able to, I'll phone the questions to you and I hope you do find time uh, to share with us the answers and we can share with the, with the participants uh, in, our, in what we call resource emails that we send after every webinar. Uh, so, uh, from the top, I see two questions to Dr. Uh, one is one has gone. It's been answered online. Okay, it's it's good you're answering online because we don't have time. Uh, so thanks, Dr. Gladys. So can we say that COVID-19 increased poaching? And can you confirm that gorillas have not caught COVID-19? I also would like to know if the safety measures for COVID masks wearing it will be continue beyond COVID. Uh, that's from Anon Anonymous. Uh, Clifford Akumu uh, says the one health approach has gained prominence with the advent of COVID-19 disease. Are African governments having policies to guide, uh, to, to guide it, sorry, something popped up, to guide its implementation? How can African countries tackle the cross-border illegal wildlife? Uh, I think Dr. Gladys or Professor Tati, you can take number two. Uh, uh, number three, uh, let me ask this. We take the three, the three questions. A good percentage of our farmers in Kenya are in the rural areas where media is not as prevalent as in urban areas. So this is the best way to educate them on human, animal, human, and environment health. I think that's an open question. Uh, that like for us here at Internews, we, we are supporting the Kenya community uh, media network uh, who is working with, uh, you know, uh, community radios? You know how impactful they can be in about six counties, uh, from Wajia to Isiolo to Laikipia uh, to Savo, where we have a lot of human wildlife conflict. Uh, so they'll be doing, you know, radio dramas and advertising these at public barazas, uh, so that people can see, um, uh, can understand about conservation and community cons uh, co uh, conservancies, uh, so that they are able to, you know, take care of the animals. And also we'll be doing trainings to the community uh, radio stations uh, around these areas uh, on solutions that are there uh, for uh, human wildlife conflict. So I hope that answers your question. We can take it offline. As Dr. Gladys, uh, would you love to take number one? 
Yes, I would. Um, thanks for all these very, these very good questions. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, COVID led to an increase in poaching because of the very reduced tourism revenue. People did not have money. They used to use the money for tourism to feed themselves. And so unfortunately, when it disappeared overnight, they were stuck. And so you could find that someone who's a porter carrying tourist luggage to gorillas, his dad is a reformed poacher. And as long as his son was bringing food, money home, he will keep out of the forest. But now the son was not bringing money. He can only go back to what, how he knows how to survive. Um, so that's why it's so important to find other ways to support conservation and communities beyond tourism. And the, because of the prevention measures that we instituted early enough, the gorillas have not developed COVID from, they've not picked up COVID from, the, from people. We're very grateful for that. And we know that we have to be really vigilant because COVID is showing us more information. For example, when the gorillas in the zoo in San Diego got COVID, there were people who was not back. And the oldest silverback in the group had to get treated with monoclonal antibodies to get better. So it means that the cause of disease zoo, the gorillas got COVID from a so yeah, so that, that makes it all even more complicated. Then the safety measures um, will continue beyond COVID. We're really continuing to advocate to the government for that. And they really see the value because other diseases can come in, other flus, other highly infectious emerging pathogens can come in. So they'll have to continue beyond COVID. And then I think I can try and answer, start to answer number two before Professor Nolan does. Uh, the One Health approach has gained prominence. It really has. And I feel that African governments are really taking the One Health platforms more seriously. They started before COVID, but now there's been a lot more engagement with the One Health platforms. I've been asked to speak not only about COVID, but other diseases and other NGOs are being engaged. And the government is becoming much more serious now. The One Health platform have become much more dynamic. And the district One Health committees that had started before COVID are now being rejuvenated. Everybody's understanding that it's a big issue. Maybe Professor Nawa can answer the question on tackling cross-border illegal wildlife trade. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was a, a good response, uh, Dr. Gladys. Uh, just to add that, yes, uh, COVID-19 really increased poaching, especially for bushmeat, uh, because you know rural life was completely ruined. And that's what we saw in most of our areas where we work. So we had to step in and, uh, uh, you know, uh, support the conservancies or wildlife management areas by paying their salaries. You know, all the rangers had been sent home on unpaid leave. And that meant there were no patrols being undertaken and people realized. So there were animals for free out for anybody to go in and pick. So we paid the salaries for almost 120, you know, rangers for about eight months. And that actually brought uh, poaching to, to a halt. Yeah. So those are some of the factors that may, you know, reverse the gains that we have made, you know, for many years in the conservation. Uh, on cross-border illegal wildlife crimes or trade or poaching, of course, these are things that we also do. We are developing a joint cross-border uh, sort of strategy on how uh, poaching can be minimized. Uh, we're having uh, joint cross-border patrols and regular meetings, information sharing, and allowing rangers to pursue poachers on either side of the border. I know it's illegally, but we agree, uh, you know, at, uh, at that low level. And that's how we bring in, you know, government administ administration uh, that are bordering the, uh, the border uh, so that they agree on how best they can pursue uh, the poachers. And of course, more important is when we use the communities themselves as front lines of defense, then we don't put in a lot of you know, time and resources as much as they know that they're actually benefiting from, uh, from conservation. Then they will defend it because the poachers usually come from you know, outside uh, the areas of jurisdic uh, jurisdiction. So there are many, you know, it's a broad area. There are many, many really approaches that we use 
uh, to stop uh, uh, transboundary sort of illegal wildlife crimes. But more important is to ensure that the laws between the two countries or the legislations are stiff enough to deter people from poaching. You know, like in, on Kenyan side, I know it's close to 20 million. And I remember there was a year somebody was jailed for 100 years when, when I, I had uh, a training for the magistrates. Uh, and first of all, I took them to Amboseli National Park. There are many of them have never seen an elephant. And, you know, elephants in Amboseli are very friendly. They saw them at a very close range. And after that, he said, okay, wait for my judgment, 100 years. And after two months, we saw that exactly. Yeah, so some of these penalties, because it's all there in the law, but most of the magistrates do not understand the law. They need also to be educated. And we've been doing a lot of capacity building for the magistrates also to understand, just the way we are doing for journalists. You know, it's a, it's a two way, you know, uh, that everybody must understand about the legal uh, frameworks within, within the area. And uh, Dr. Gladys talked about beyond tourism as another strategy to, you know, ensure that communities derive benefits in the event that tourism is not doing well. What we are doing now is to start projects to do with the, you know, Red Plus project where communities can benefit from, you know, um, uh, keeping their forests intact and so on. So we are investing in a lot of resources. Uh, we're also doing non-timber forest products, pharmaceutical products from uh, plant genetic materials that can be exported. Zimbabwe is very good at that. They are doing, you know, uh, from bobs and so on. Yeah, so we are now looking at what can we do beyond tourism uh, that can bring income to the communities. Uh, I think I'll stop there, Kim. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Stati and Dr. Gladys. Um, I like that bit about magistrates. I, I remember someone told me, uh, like when I started, I said pangolins are the most trafficked mammals right now. And uh, so, um, uh, someone was arrested uh, with the, you know, pangolin having uh, poached them, and the magistrate was asking, "What are those?" Uh, he, he never heard about that, and probably we can talk offline on how we can do, you know, such a training because now this is the second time I'm hearing about it. And I think it's very important. Uh, so I would love us to take just one more round, and then we can stop it from there. And uh, Prof, I'll come back to you. Uh, Esther Nakazi is asking if Tanzania is still lagging behind in terms of implementing COVID-19 measures in humans, is it the same in wildlife too? And uh, Esther asks Dr. Gladys, could we hear more about that by Mr. Ziku, Zikusoka and how it's working? Thanks all the, for the presentations. Uh, that's Esther. Uh, I'm looking at these. Uh, the questions, I think we have answered them in one form or the other during our presentations. Um, can baboons transmit diseases? Uh, this is an age old question, uh, going all back to HIV. Uh, probably, uh, Gladys, you can take that too. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sitati, uh, Prof. Sitati, if you could answer the Tanzanian uh, part, then we'll go to Dr. Gladys. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, of course, uh, Tanzania has been quite uh, slow in terms of picking up the uh, to address COVID-19 because as I said, of the previous political regime uh, where COVID-19 was never recognized and uh, uh, nobody believed in it. And there was a serious campaign across the country that people should not worry. This, uh, uh, sort of a business, and uh, uh, we are also jeopardizing the lives of Africans. So that really sunk in people's, you know, mind, and uh, that's why the uh, vaccination rate has been quite, quite low. Uh, of course, uh, most of us have taken, but uh, uh, quite a, um, a bit younger of the younger generation. Uh, they, they are not keen, and the same to you know the remote areas, interior areas. Uh, nobody wants when they see a government vehicle going there, they all run into the bushes uh, because they think uh, this is not uh, the best thing to, to do. Uh, because that's what uh, the former regime tried to, to pass on. But now, with the current regime, I think uh, we're now seeing a bit of a change in attitude, and uh, people are now slowly and willing going for our mm -hmm. vaccinations. Now, when it comes to wildlife management, of course, uh, Tanzania has done uh, very well. 
It's a country that has the largest area under conservation, over 40%, with really many, you know, uh, protected areas, national parks, game reserves, forests, uh, you know, game, game controlled areas, wildlife management areas, name them. You know, it has actually the best amores in Africa uh, with a huge area. And it had one of the biggest elephant population, for example, it was third in, in Africa, uh, but the recent massacre brought them down from over 100,000 to just a mere 45,000. You know, uh, now we are seeing an increase uh, slowly. Yeah, and uh, they have also tried to tighten the, the policies and legislations, and that is what has really brought Pochim, you know, down. Yeah, and many other projects. It's a complicated area that needs to have very holistic and integrated approaches to be able to uh, to secure wildlife. I, I think that's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Dr. Gladys. Uh, yes, I've seen the question from Esther uh, regarding the app. Mm, I would say that the during the time of the anthrax outbreak, it was translated, the disease anthrax was translated into the local language and people could send SMS short code and get information about how to avoid, what anthrax is, how to avoid getting it, how to report on it, what to look out for. Then there was also so, and they could get that information in the local languages. Then there was also a, there was also a toll-free platform where people could call to ask about diseases of anthrax, and then we hope the Ministry of Health each had used it also when they, the Ebola outbreak occurred and Marburg, and now they have their own. So we no longer support them in that way, but we're glad that we're able to give them that idea and they run with it. And uh, there's a question here from Shem about animal health. Do governments, are governments ready to vaccinate or diagnose animals for COVID? Um, actually COVID vaccination in animals is still experimental, but however, in America, because they've had it in animals in zoos, they've started to vaccinate animals in zoos, still on an experimental basis. So the wetis, which is the same, which broke off from Pfizer, pro created a COVID vaccine for animals. And they vaccinated great apes in zoos, uh, lions, tigers, you know, the ones that are most susceptible to COVID, the large cats and great apes and other animals, but the most susceptible and mink, you know, like uh, master leads, those, those species. And so in Uganda, actually, we, we've organized for the chimps in Nga Island, which is a sanctuary, and the animals in the Uganda Wildlife Education Center, the primates and the large cats to get vaccinated. It's still under experimental. It hasn't yet been commercialized, but there's scope for that. Vaccinating animals in the wild is very complicated because you need to reach 70% of the population, just like for humans. And so it's much easier to just vaccinate uh, people to stop them interacting with give animals, but also vaccinating captive animals that you can see and monitor is a better place to begin as we better understand how the animals react to the vaccines and all these new variants which are coming up, how well, what vaccine can cover all of them very well. It's, we're still studying this, and but it's a good way that at least vaccination is allowing the economy to open up. Uh, a community, to keep themselves safe from transmission. Yes, they, we've continued to educate them, as I said in my presentation, their understanding about hand hygiene, hand washing, hand sanitation, even when you're touching your pets, you know, make sure that you're always sanitizing your hands or washing your hands after touching your pets. And in that way, you prevent yourself getting diseases from them or giving them diseases. By the way, COVID has, the, the prevention measures for COVID are not helping only to prevent COVID, but so many other diseases. I think someone should do a study to see how other how other diseases have the prevalence of other diseases compared to before the pandemic. Because now when you wash your hands, you prevent colds, you prevent diarrhea and so many other diseases, you know? So all those measures that prevent, that are being used to prevent COVID are helping to reduce other diseases, which is something that's very good. Yes, baboons can transmit diseases, they can give us diseases and we can give them diseases. Um, so in fact, they found that all great apes, 
humans, great apes, and old world primates like baboons, babbit monkeys, we all have the same protein receptors that the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus attaches to, which means we can easily get this, they can easily get COVID like us and can have the same symptoms as us and the same impact. So we, we have to be very careful. Um, to form several vets for bad animals and prefer animals, several vets, there actually there are more and more vets for wild animals. When I first started out as the first veterinary officer for Uganda Wildlife Authority, there was only me and a vet at the zoo. And now I think we're almost 20. Okay, maybe 10, between 10 and 20 working, you know, 10 work more full-time and 20 work on a part-time basis. This is only Uganda, but all over. Like I used to go to Kenya for training because Kenya Wildlife Service Vet Unit had been running for about five years before we set up ours in Uganda. And I got a lot of training from Kenya. So I know that Tanzania, there were two vets at the time. Kenya had like four vets, four or five vets. South Africa had very many. They were way ahead of us, but it's slowly, it's really picked up. And more and more vets are also getting involved in One Health activities. The use of vets in wildlife is really being appreciated now. Um, you, you said something about since COVID originated from seafoods, there's, there's no proof yet where COVID has originated from. Some people think it's seafood, but there's no concrete evidence. Some people think it's uh, like bats, there's no concrete evidence or an intermediate host. There's no concrete evidence yet. So, but we just have to, the only way to prevent getting diseases from seafood is through very good food hygiene. You know, like you have to boil the food, you have to inspect it, you have to not just eat it anyhow. You have to be very, very careful what you eat. And that's why we need to really tell people about the dangers of poaching because they're going to pick up some funny disease and it could be like what happened in China, it spread all over the world. Although we don't know where the COVID came from, up to now, we still don't know. And actually one of the reasons I'm on the, okay, we joined the WHO Sago is one of the things is there's still, WHO still can't say exactly where COVID came from, but it's something that they're speaking to all the scientists to find out where did this come from? Because in, by knowing where it came from, we are more likely to know how to prevent it happening again in the future or any other similar kind of pathogen. And what we're doing on the WHO Sago is to help them to develop a framework to prevent future emerging and re-emerging pathogens. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gladys and all our panelists uh, from Elizabeth Merab. Uh, from the nation, Kenya, Noah Sitati, WWF, Tanzania, Dr. Gladys, conser conser conservation through uh, public health. And uh, with that great recording that we started with, Dr. Wangoi Modigani, Minister of Health, uh, we do appreciate your time. It's a Friday afternoon for crying out loud. Uh, I know most of us have signed of uh, both mentally and physically, but before time to be with us, our uh, mind is to request you uh, to keep this conversation on ongoing. Uh, do you give us permission to share uh, your presentations? If you could share with us and your contacts. I uh, do have that permission, uh, dear our speakers, uh, because yes, I know, yeah. 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 yeah, I will share. Okay, can you share with us so that we can share with all our, uh, even for you, Merab, I know you had talking points. I'll share with us and I hope- I share, start share. This. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I hope, um, uh, for uh, our colleagues, uh, thank you so much also, our participants. We had a lot of people register and 65 persons uh, have been, you know, you've been on these, uh, never minding that we were late and you've stayed with us until the end. Thank you so much. We hope you've learned a lot. Personally, I've learned a lot. I will upload, as I said in the beginning, uh, this webinar on our website at journalism.net. Uh, please, as you go to look for that, uh, and also on our YouTube channel, uh, still at journalism.net, please join uh, join us as a member. Uh, you'll go and see over the website about uh, how to join, and it's very easy steps. And from there, you'll be receiving a lot of re resources uh, from us, like this webinar and other workshops we do, and also uh, we offer story grants for you to be able to go and uh, do these kind of stories that we've gotten from our speakers. I'd like us to stop there. I wish you a very uh, good uh, weekend uh, for the Kenyans. Happy Jamhuri Day.
uh, stay safe and please get vaccinated for COVID-19. God bless. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.